All right, we are live with the first Coach's Corner. One, that will be on the YouTube channel, too. This is uh, the first pertaining to the league. So the, the idea of this is to have a guest speaker on every show. And we'll talk things around the league, uh, maybe some other topics as well in regards to MLB the show. But um, since we're not started yet, we're just going to kind of go over the draft. So the guest for today is one of the commissioners, one of the mods, also one of the leaders of the Vicky Fan Club, Strikeout 1066. <laughs> What's up, guys? We are uh, we're excited to, to get the league going. I know that the, the draft is taking a little bit longer than maybe some of us have anticipated, but don't worry, we're, we're still working hard, and we're definitely excited to, uh, to make this video for you guys today. Oh, yeah. So what we're going to cover today is a couple things. Um, I had some announcements, but Strikeout hadn't, I don't know. Well, yeah, Strikeout wouldn't be able to hear it because I already recorded that video and it's separate. So we're going to talk to Draft, but first thing I want to talk about is the league. So I kind of looked at the polls, and I think what we're going to be, well, I don't think, what we're going to be going with is we're going to be going with a 29-game season since it seems that people are wanting to do two games per week. Absolutely have no problem with that. I totally get it. Everyone's got a life outside of Twitch. And I kind of talked about it on stream earlier in the week that there are some people that will play in leagues, but they want that to be separate from their stream schedule. So even though it's like, hey, you're on streaming, why don't you, like, why aren't you, why can't you play more games? Like, we have our, we have our idea of, you know, what we want to do at our time. So I think two games a week is pretty fair. And with it being a 29 game season, it gives us an opportunity to try to get in a couple of seasons. Just initially, Mr. Strikeout, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I think that with everything going on, everyone has, you know, new work schedules or homework schedules or things that they have to adjust to two games a week, definitely fair uh, three games a week, especially if it's a nine inning game can, can take up a significant amount of time. So I, I think that two games a week will get us uh, a few seasons in hopefully, hopefully to replace the, the games that we would have been watching in the MLB. I know you're, going to be editing some some clips of of people's games so you know the the faster we're able to get the games out the more we're going to be able to create content for you guys yeah, it'll be pretty fun look definitely looking forward to it i got a, a email today from the padres about opening day so i think they um just cliff noting it you know obviously apologizing for what's going on like not like it's their fault um they said that they were going to be playing god bless america which should have happened 12 minutes ago for opening day and they are also providing free lunch for all of the first responders here in San Diego with Phil's barbecue, which is pretty cool. That's, that's a great gesture, honestly. I mean, with everything that's been going on, I, I think that the appreciation that's being shown to first responders is, you know, finally some of these guys that, that work hard every day are, are getting the recognition they deserve Definitely, definitely agree. But that said, no baseball, but we'll have some baseball of our own. Let's talk to draft. So even though we're in the third round, I thought a good stopping point would be the end of round two. And the reason I say the end of round two is because I feel like every team has had two picks. We've had some time to let round two settle in. How are you feeling about your picks? I mean, I didn't want to, I know I just said before, don't want to like give up <laughs> strategy or anything, but just tell me how you feel about your picks and we'll just I leave feel, it at that. I feel pretty good. Uh, first round, I went with Jacob deGrom. I was the first person to pick a starting pitcher and, you know, we were talking about this before we started, but. You know, with the regular season, and we just touched on it, we don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, I, too, was considering taking, you know, a Walker Bueller, a Jack Flaherty, someone that could potentially improve, right? DeGrom is getting a little bit older. 
He had the two best seasons of his career, hopefully, for, for Mets fans out there. He can continue, but I wasn't sure how I felt about taking him. Uh, but after we found out the news that the season was going to be delayed, it was a it was a no-brainer. I looked at his pitch selection. That's a huge thing for me for drafting. Right, I don't really care about the overall ratings of players. The, the specific ratings pitch selection is the biggest thing, and I really liked DeGrom's pitch selection. And then with my second pick, uh, I went with DJ LeMahieu. Uh, I think DJ LeMahieu is underrated when it comes to defense in MLB The Show as well as, you know, in real life. So, you know, I had to go with the Yankee. Got got a DJ LeMahieu. I thought it was a good pick. I, I'm feeling pretty confident moving into round three and, and into the future. I feel like I have a very good uh, core group. Of players, I know that's silly to say with only two players, but you know, good, good leader pitching wise, and good leader defensively to build around. Yep, got to have those cornerstones. I think it, going forward, I want to say probably by round ten. Fingers crossed that we get there smoothly and somewhat quickly. By then, you've got ten guys, so I'll be curious to see. Are they balanced for team? Just speaking in generals, are you going to see five pitchers, five position players? I think one of the funniest things for me when looking at the draft is seeing how do you go about picking a team? Because we're all like the draft pick that you have is is a, there's pros and cons to it. So how do you take that? The players on the board, what do you value? How do you decide to build your team? Is it based off the best player available? Do you have a plan in place like I am really I watch these other picks so I I mean I get to see more picks than usual because they're getting sent to me and people are sending lists but just the mindset that people have with the picks I find really interesting it's one of my favorite things about a fantasy draft and seeing what is important to other people yeah I agree I've been I've been keeping tabs as well obviously I think you know we've been paying attention to the draft more than maybe uh, some of you guys out there which the link is in the Discord. You don't have to ask us for it. Uh, but uh, I agree. Uh, it's really interesting. I, I've noticed some people, you know, uh, I'm going to point one out here, someone that plays in a lot of tournaments for me. That's Grimmy. Uh, Grimmy is a very good hitter. And I noticed that two of his picks uh, were, were very, very good hitters. He picked Matt Olson and Javier Baez. Those are two people that have maybe a little bit lower vision than other people might go after. But I I think it's really interesting to see the different approaches. And, you know, if you know that you're really good, you know, we'll pick on Sammy here. He's really good with Matt Carpenter, you know, eighth round comes around. And for some reason, Matt Carpenter is still available. That plays into people's decision-making as well. I mean, I already picked him, so I'll talk about it. But my, my third round pick was Trey Turner. Last year in in the game, I hit, you know, 80 home runs with Trey Turner in, I don't know, 250 games. It was insane. He was unstoppable for me. And, and I think that a lot of people, regardless of, of their, you know, approach going into the draft, if they see somebody that, that they don't think should be there and they're still there, it's interesting to see, you know, blue picked – Garver, I don't know if Garver was was going to be his pick going into the draft, but he saw that you know he had a good bat. He wanted to to get him, and it's really interesting to see people's approaches for sure. It really is. Just another question that I I was going to bring up too. He brought kind of touched on it with Turner playing rank seasons, playing events. You know, there's some that play BR, especially with BR, and even now with you know, events in rank season because we get we're forced to use more live series players and even with your tournaments because there's different themes or use cards that we don't normally use. Because, I mean, we go into rank season, for the most part, we're using God squads mm. in one sense, not only because they're the best players in the game, kind of because we have to to keep the a level playing field. Do you feel that people are at an advantage being able to play these other modes in Diamond Dynasty with the exposure to other cards? 
I definitely do. And, you know, you touched on it, but that's one of the biggest reasons why I held tournaments on my channel. Um, people, I think, run the same team day in and day out. You know, they, they get used to, you know, Johnny Bench being their catcher and their first baseman being Frank Thomas, Lou Gehrig, whoever it was last year, you played with them, you know, eight hours a day, whether it was Conquest or whatever. And, you know, you really get used to those players. And for some people, if they don't have the, you know, the diversity of, of you know, playing a franchise, playing a March to October, they don't get, they don't get exposed to these cards and, I think that if you play in, you know, a tournament, whether it's on my channel, on your channel, on someone else's channel, you, you play March, October, you play franchise, you get all these different experiences, you're definitely at an advantage, whether whether it's simply being able to adapt to a card you've never used before, or it's finding out that, you know, bronze Lourdes Gurriel Jr. last year was a BR glitch. I think that a lot of people that that diversify the game modes that they play and diversify the cards that they're using are definitely going to be at advantage at an advantage. Yeah, seeing some of the picks in the later rounds will be really interesting because I can already see people making picks like, "Oh yeah, I raked with him last year, or he's been great for me." You know, in events this year. I mean, I'll I'll throw myself out there. Eloy Jimenez has been a guy that I never would have ever considered using. <laughs> and he's a silver, and I'm hitting almost 500 with him in events against good pitching. Golds and diamonds, the dude just rakes. I don't know what it is about him, but he just does. But I know when I go into ranked seasons, he can't be on my team because I need to have someone better for more elite pitchers, especially going up in difficulty. Oh, just things like that to consider. I'm, I'll touch on me for a little bit, and then we'll get into other people's picks. Um, I went with two pitchers. I went with Thor in round two and Bueller in round one. Not to talk major strategy, but for me, I like to start with pitching. You know, we may touch on MLB The Show 20's pitching for a little bit, but my mindset is, I mean, you guys watch me play at franchise and play other games, I have the mindset of I'm a pitch-to-contact guy. So what I'm trying to do is throw off your timing and induce bad contact, which isn't always the best thing. But that's my mindset, just like in, in real life. That, that's what I did as a pitcher. So what I try to do with my, with my two cornerstone guys in my rotation is get two guys that are both good in terms of attributes with certain things that are important to me, but they're pitched differently. You have Bueller who's got the four-seamer, but then he has a slider-cutter combination. I talk about that a lot on stream. One's obviously faster, one breaks less. So if I can play those off of each other really well, boom. It's going to make it hard for this person to hit against him. Plus, you throw in a knuckle curve and a two-seamer, so I can kind of mess with the speeds too. Same thing with Thor. He's got the four-seamer, but hey, I can play the sinker off of that, especially with the outlier on there. And then you've got the change up. You still have a slider and curve for off speed, but trying to play two or three pitches together with the option number four for fifth just to make my opponent have to take up that think space with multiple pitches. No, so, I'm happy with my picks. I kind of did not really want to go with Thor, but, you know, with the season being delayed, I thought, hey, you know, I'm hoping that he can have uh, – he, he hasn't had necessarily great, great years the last couple of years. I'm hoping maybe he could have a bounce back to shoot up. One thing for some people to consider, no, I don't think a lot of people have done it, at least in terms of some of the conversations I've had. With the season being delayed, ratings are going to be affected too. So though we are playing with the MLB Live rosters, these are the Diamond Dynasty cards. So roster updates do affect – during the course of this league ratings Bueller is a guy that I assume is going to go up whenever we get to playing if we do Thor I was hoping he would but I felt that his floor would be 82 and I was fine with that um 
this will be really interesting when we get into the late rounds, depending on how far we go, because you may, as people may take flyers on guys because, hey, if he has a good season, it's a boost. It's a free upgrade since there is no progression and regression. Um, hey, this guy may be a little scary for me because he had a bad year last year, <laughs> Carpenter. So mm-hmm. you worry about, is this the ceiling? Could you drop worse? It's different because I don't think a lot of people, and myself included, didn't think this would be the way that it would work um, when they kind of talked about MLB Live. But then I, as I was listening to it, I'm like, hmm, in a draft, that'd be really a, a different approach because you could be scared off to certain players because, hey, maybe they had one of those once-in-a-lifetime seasons. Maybe the advanced metrics don't really measure up to what their rating says, and you worry that they're going to kind of regress to the mean. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I totally agree with you. I was I was going into it, and you know I talked about it before. But one of the reasons I picked DJ Lemayhu is looking at his his stats, not just for the last three years, but his last four years. He averages like a three fifteen, three twenty batting average. He has a few Gold Gloves. I I really expected him to to go up. Um, you know. It's, it stinks that we're getting a delayed season and, you know, it's a little bit of a risk to draft somebody on the hopes that he's going to improve. Uh, but like I talked about earlier, I think that DJ LeMahieu is going to stay solid no matter what, but I think it's going to be interesting, especially when we look at some of the prospects that are now in the game, right? I'll, I'll pick out one that, that got a postseason upgrade last year. That's Jesus Cesardo. Jesus Cesardo is a bronze card this year in Diamond Dynasty, and he just got a prospect card. But players like that, players like, you know, Gavin Lux, I don't know if he's in Diamond Dynasty yet, but players like that are going to be really interesting. We could totally see those guys go at the end of the year or at the end of the draft to see, you know, hey, maybe maybe this card's going to jump to a silver or something like that. I think it's going to be really interesting like you said, to see the end of the draft and the strategies of getting those last few players, or maybe I know that, you know, that you really wanted Matt Carpenter and I, I pick him up and I'm saying, all right, Sammy, let me, let me trade. And then boom, he gets upgraded. Now he's worth even more. So I'm interested to see if anyone is going to try to uh, make any trades as well using those players. If, if I leak on my stream that I really, really like, x y or z and i i expect him to be in the 24th round and then right before i pick him somebody like shred who's in my stream picks him and is like all right strike out i want this guy give me him and i'll give you him i, I really am interested to see how that's going to play out as well because we have really no indication of when the regular season is going to start so those can be high risk high reward picks towards the end of the draft oh yeah most definitely so well, taking a look here in the first round, I think we can universally agree on one thing, and then we'll go on an individual basis. Um, the first pick was Mike Trout. Now, in general, that's a a great pick. Yeah, there's no, you, know, you can't go wrong with Mike Trout. But in terms of MLB the show, I must say I was surprised. Um, since I can talk about it now, yep. my number one pick was Cody Bellinger. He, last year for me, was the only live series card outside of Andrew Miller for obvious reasons with the lefties, lack of lefties. Um, But position player-wise, Belly was the last live series card to be on my team. The only reason I took out his live series card was to put in his finest card. He was by far the best player to hit with, in my opinion, for all of the live series players. And to see the draft, and to not see him not only go not go number one, but to drop down to three, I feel like Blue got a steal mm-hmm. getting him at the three spot. Couldn't agree more. I was, you know, I, I was like, okay, mile high, great, great pick in Mike Trout. I could I could see the argument for wanting a five tool guy in in center field, but I was definitely surprised that he wasn't first. And then again, I was surprised that Bo took somebody other than than Cody Bellinger as well. 
Oh yeah. Bo's uh Bo's an interesting guy. <laughs> I, I would say I was kinda surprised that in in that sense, I was kinda surprised that Trout went one. You thought that Arenado would go one. Yeah. He's a huge Rockies fan. And it it it's one of those things that, that you have happened in the draft. Like I'm a Cardinals fan. I have no Cardinals on my team. By the end of this draft, I will. Not naming anyone specific, but <laughs> I've, it, I've, I'm going to get someone as a, a Cardinal because I'm a Cardinal fan. My favorite player, we all obviously know, like he has a worth to me. But for Arenado, I was kind of surprised to see it with Arenado being his favorite player and him being really solid on the game. I just assumed that he was going to pick up number one. So when he said try, I was like, wow. But then when I saw Trout, I'm like, well, Trout, but not Belly. Wow. And then, you know, Belly falls down to three. I was, I was really surprised by that. Not going to lie. Yeah, looking... and especially with, with the perks that that Arnado had last year. The What are they called? The the quirks, I think, actually, mm-hmm. that he had last year. They ha- they have a significant impact on on the game sometimes, especially with the outlier. You were talking about it earlier. I was very surprised with with Miles Pick as well. Oh, looking at the the rest of the first round, value wise, give me one player that you were um, thought was a great pick at the value that they were picked at, and give me a player that you were surprised went as high as they did. So, I'm, I think that MLB fan, the twenty seventh pick. He got Araldus Chapman. I think, you know, looking at some of these these players that I don't necessarily think are bad or don't necessarily and necessarily think they're bad picks, like I'm surprised that people like Trevor Story, Pete Alonzo, right? Those guys went before Araldus Chapman. Araldus Chapman isn't the best overall left-handed reliever in the game, but I would say he's probably the hardest one to hit. So I was pretty surprised to see him almost make it into the second round. We talked about people's drafting strategies, and regardless of your drafting strategy, right, regardless of what Blue's drafting strategy when he went into this, if Bellinger falls to you, you have to take him, right? And I feel like there were plenty of opportunities for guys that took, you know, Kettle Marte, Ketel Marte with, with the A's, Right. I was very surprised that he got picked before Araldus Chapman as well. Uh, one thing that I was surprised that it fell that far, I was pretty surprised that Anthony Rizzo fell as far as he did. I, I really feel like Anthony Rizzo gives you a great lefty back, gives you pretty good defense. I was not expecting him to get to the to the second round. And obviously Cubs fan was was happy. He got Chris Bryant and then Rizzo back to back, but I was definitely surprised to see people, you know, like Pete Alonzo. And I know we're talking about the people that are very, very good at hitting. I was very surprised to, to see him taken before a Rizzo, before a Chapman, even before Joey Gallo. If you're going for a power hitter, a pure power hitter, Joey Gallo is being played by some of the top guys at second base because they don't want to take him out of the lineup. It's it's really interesting. What what about you, Sammy? What what were picks that you were surprised when as high as they did and vice versa? Oh, I can tell you I'm going to co-sign on or all this Chapman, so much so that Chapman was my second pick. Mm-hmm. Um, I Well, I'd say third, because I had belly number one. Clearly, he wasn't going to fall, so then you make a realistic list. And I had Bueller or Flaherty, one of them, and then I had Chapman at number two for – a couple of reasons. One, Chapman is hard to hit, yes. But then you look at his pitch selection in comparison to a hater, in comparison mm-hmm. to a Andrew Miller or the other lefties that we have in the league. He has high value because there are only so many lefties out there. And for him to go as late as he did, I, I get the starting pitching. Trust me. I, I mean, I picked two. But then you have that you have the balance of okay, I need starters, but then my starters can only pitch every X amount of games. You need those guys that can play every day. So to see a pitcher that you could throw on the mound multiple times a week go 
late, especially in we'll have to see how people are able to to hit once we get started. But given the way that pitching is right now, pitching could be difficult. One of the mm-hmm. things that helps us to be able to have the huge speed distance. So having a guy that comes in, maybe throws mid nineties, maybe low nineties topping out and then be able to bring in a Chapman after you're completely changing the meta for that game. You have to be able to adjust on the fly when it matters in the game to a hundred and upper nineties. And some people do struggle with that. So I think that was a really, really good pick. Um, a pick that I was surprised to see go as high as he did. I like Alonzo. I mean, I pulled him as a diamond. I was kind of surprised to see him go at 18. I know he has a lot of power, but I feel with pitching, I guess this will be more of a preference thing because there are so many right-handed pitchers. Lefties tend to be able to hit better off of righties. You see the ball a little bit better. I know Gallo does have a smaller, you know, his vision is definitely smaller than Alonzo's, but power righties for me just don't have the same value as power lefties. Lefties tend to be able to hit the ball better in terms of contact and power and just in my experience, regardless of the ratings. So I was a little bit surprised to see him go as high as he did, especially because he is just the first baseman. He doesn't offer any other like he doesn't have any other value for you other than just the power hitting first base. And with Gallo, you have a guy that does have a good arm. He can play in the outfield. He can play third base. So you, you're you locked in to Alonzo at first. So that also could lock you out of other value picks at first base versus you pick a Gallo early. You do have that same power, but you still have flexibility on what you can do with your lineup. Yeah, I agree with everything. And, and, versatility i think especially this year we've you know not to not to harp on the game at all but we've seen a little bit of a issue with defense for sure and like you said to only have a a player that's a, that's able to play one position and you know not not a knock on Pete Alonso but he's not a gold glove first baseman right to only have him in one position taken at such a high pick I couldn't agree with you more. I was definitely shocked. And that is, you know, that was New York Mets fan that did pick him. So I, I can see it a little bit, but. Oh, yeah, 100%. definitely. Yeah. As a fan, I definitely, I get the pick just for the value. I just like, yeah, but the, the fan, the fan part does play a role in it because, hey, I mean, that's your team you want to get. You know, you do want to get one of your team's best players, mm-hmm. especially or if Albert you're Pujols. not the Mets. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, All right, let's take a let's take a look at round two.